Well, good morning, folks, and welcome to our service of worship in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's lovely to have you with us as we join together to praise and to worship his wonderful name. Well, as we finish our study in the book of Jonah, we have seen the depths of God's grace in saving not only his wayward prophet, but also the wicked nation of Nineveh. And this morning, we're going to see that God's grace has no prejudice, as Jonah is going to find out. Jonah's biggest issue was that he didn't want the Ninevites to experience God's grace. He didn't want God to be who he is. And who is God? Well, as Jonah proclaimed at the end of verse 2, For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. This is who God is. In fact, it's repeated frequently throughout the scriptures by God to his people to remind them of his greatness, his power, his love, and his grace. But I wonder today, what prejudices do we hold in our lives? What is hindering us from sharing the wonderful good news and gospel of Jesus Christ to others? I trust that by the end of this service, we will have a greater resolve to set aside differences in order that we may proclaim the whole truth of God's word to a dying and perishing generation. Because at the end of the day, our call to worship reminds us of the hope that only Christ can give. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. We're going to sing to God's praise now as we join together to sing uh, from the Scottish Sing Sam Psalter. Praise God my soul with all my heart to the well-known tune of Before the Throne of God Above. Let us stand and sing to our wonderful God. Folks, let's join our hearts together in our prayer of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Yes, praise God, my soul, with all my heart. Let me exalt his holy name. Father, it is good to come before your presence to exalt your name. 
We adore you as the great King and God, our Lord, who exercises perfect justice and righteousness. We praise you that the Lord is merciful and kind, to anger slow and full of grace. God, we adore you for every physical benefit and indeed spiritual blessing that you pour out upon us as your children. Lord, if we were to tell of your great deeds, there would be so many to speak of. As we've been reminded, he satisfies your deep desires from his unending stores of good. We praise you that we come to you and we can call you Abba, Father. How amazing to think that God who created the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets and everything in all creation, that you delight to hear your created image bearers call you Father. Our mind baffles at your greatness. But we bless you for being our great provider and sustainer. The one who has the first and last word. And yet, Lord, we're reminded that we are sinners in need of your grace daily. Yes, we know we try to keep your commandments. We try to seek to live for you in every way. We yearn to be more and more like Christ. And yet, Father, we do confess that we are weak in need of your strength and forgiveness. Merciful Father, forgive us once more in Jesus' name. Help us to set aside prejudice in order to honor you and your word of truth. We thank you for how the psalm has reminded us that you will not constantly reprove or in his anger hide your face because you do not punish our misdeeds or give our sins their just reward because in Jesus Christ and by his death upon Calvary's tree, When we come to you like the Ninevites in true repentance and faith, we are forgiven. And we can know that you are with us and your blood has cleansed us. And yet, Holy Spirit, we are mere human beings. So we ask you to mold us and shape us into the likeness of Christ. That you would help us in our warfare against sin because it is a war. Help us to put on the full armor of God. And to stand strong to the very end. Giving you all the glory and the honor that is due your wonderful name, Lord Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. Boys and girls, do you want to come down to the front? And I'll have a wee chat with you there. Well, good morning. How are you doing this week? Doing all right, yeah? Good, good, good. Fantastic. Well, today we're going to talk about anger. Has anybody watched this side of the TV yet? Yes, yes, we watched it yesterday. I watched both of them. You watched both of them well. Yes, there is anger, isn't it? That's the emotion, anger. And hands up, well, yeah, Alan. So that's anger. Okay, now anger. Hands up. Who's been angry? Hands up in the church. Who's been angry? Yes. Good, we're all very honest here. Super hands down. If we're all honest, we've all got angry over something. Whether that's mummy not tell, or telling us to tidy up our room and we don't want to do it, or maybe you're not picked for a school team and you're angry and annoyed about that. There's lots of things that could get us angry. What are some of the things that might make you angry? Some of those things I said, yeah, absolutely. We all get angry from time to time. But do you think God wants us to get angry? I think God wants us to get angry no, of course he doesn't. Sometimes, yes, there's a time to be angry. Jesus himself was angry whenever the people used the temple for wrong things. But most of the time he doesn't want us to get angry. And in our Bible story today, Jonah gets really angry with God. In fact, he goes off and he huffs with God. You were huffed before. Yeah. Sometimes we huff when we're angry. And he huffed with God because God did something. God saved the wicked men of and he did not want them to do that. But do you want to realize something? And this is what he said about God. I hope they come on the screen. He says, For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and finding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. See, do you want to realize that God was a good and gracious God? That he loves people and those who say sorry for their sins are <coughs> And to help me explain that, I have something with me this morning. Alright? We're going to think about 
Jenny. Jenny had a terrible problem with anger. And sometimes there's anger, well, sometimes you broke things. Have you ever broken something when you're angry? Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. And mom and dad did not know what they were going to do with Jenny until dad had an idea. He said, son, I know that you get angry sometimes, but you have to control your anger. And every time you get angry, this is what he said, instead of smashing something, I want you to take some nails from my toolbox and my hammer, and I want you to hammer nails into the fence as hard as you can. So that day he came home from school, he was really angry, and he got that hammer nails, and he tapped them in like, oh, he was really cross. The next day he did the same thing. As the week started to go on, he realized that he wasn't hammering out his penny nails. And then all of a sudden, he didn't hammer in any nails. And so he went back to his dad and said, Dad, I was angry today. And his dad said, I'm really proud of you. Well done. But here's an idea. Every time, every time you have a good day, I want you to take some of the nails out of the fence. So as the days went on, he started to take out the nails. And before you knew it, after a couple of weeks, there was not a nail left in sight. And Dad went over to him and said, well done, Jimmy. But look at the holes. Do you see the holes? In the fence. You see, anger leaves a mark that isn't easy to cover or fix. Every time we get angry, it hurts us. It hurts other people. Most of all, it hurts God. Do you know how much it hurt God? It sent his only son, Jesus, to the cross. Because what did he do? He was nailed to the cross, wasn't he? By his hands and his feet, for our sins, for those angry words, those angry thoughts, for all those bad things that we do. But he promises that if we come to him and say sorry for our sins, that we will go to be with him <coughs> forever. Because as our memory verse has been reminding us, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So I hope and pray that each and every one of us will remember it. And I hold up my hand. I struggle with anger too. I get angry too, even as a minister. But let's not get angry. Let's leave it with the Lord. And let's trust that Jesus will do His work in His way and His time. One of the say verse chapter 3. One, two, three. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Great. I'm going to sing your song now. Uh, if I can remember what it is, I'm going to say, Oh, be careful little eyes what you see, careful little tongues what you say. It's all a song that reminds us that our Father of love looking down your love, so we have to be careful what we see and do and say. Listen and say to God's words.
seats. Unfortunately, I've forgotten to the actions. So sorry about that. Next time we'll have to remember. Thank you for being so Jonah chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. This is God's word to us. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Amen. We thank God for his word, and let's take a moment to pray that he'll add his blessing to it as we come to study. (coughs) Father God, we thank you for this reminder, Lord God, that We have to be careful what we say and think and do because we realize, Lord, that people are watching us. Forgive us when we lose our temper, when we fly off the handlebars, when we do a Jonah. Forgive us those times. Help us now as we come to study your word that, Father, each and every one of us would be challenged to the core of our being as we seek to live for and honor you above all else. Speak to us, Lord, not through me, but through the the voice of the Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I remember attending my first Ballymena United match at the showgrounds. So I went with my friend Dave, his dad, Alistair, and his uncle, Tom Greer. I was amazed at the passion that the Sky Blues had for their wee team. And what amazed me perhaps even more was that to my right, we had all the Presbyterian ministers, and over to the left of the stand, we had all the rowdies, and at times you weren't too sure who was who. But anyway, it was Derby Day. Balamina versus Coleraine. And I admit that I found myself getting caught up in all the chants and the cheers, especially, oh, we hate Coleraine, particularly when they beat us. And even yet, when I see a Korean FC buys, there's something inside of me that wells up to sing that chant. I know I very much need your prayers. But you know, as I think about that, yes, it's a silly illustration, but it is one that sadly is so true in our society today. Sadly, our world is filled with prejudice. And our wee country is full of it. Themans against us. Many homes and lives have been ruined and even churches too. And here in Jonah 4 the same thing happens. You'll remember in chapter 1 Jonah fled because as a Jew he didn't want to serve or share God's message with that pagan Ninevites because they were sworn enemies. So he runs away on the boat and is thrown over sea and God saves in the fish's belly. And finally in chapter 3 he obeyed the Lord and he went and proclaimed his message. And as we saw last week, that from the least to the greatest in Nineveh, they repented. Revival 
took place. And yet, instead of being overjoyed for God's gracious act, Jonah sulks in anger. But God is going to show him and us a valuable lesson. That God's grace has no prejudice under three headings. Firstly, we see Jonah's unrighteous anger. Now, yes, as I said with the children, it is important to note that there is such a thing as righteous anger. Remember Christ's anger at the money changers in the temple. They were hindering people from worshipping God. There are times when it is right to be angry. When we see injustice, persecution, violence, God's people being hindered from worshipping him. But quite often, our anger isn't righteous. It's often an outburst over trivial annoyances. The same was true concerning Jonah, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, it's not like the Ninevites had rejected God's message or persecuted Jonah for preaching this message. In chapter 3, the Ninevites dramatically repented. They, They mourned for their sin, even their king. So why is Jonah angry? Well, he answers it, doesn't it? In prayer, in verse 2. O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Here we get to the heart of Jonah. He's full of prejudice. His so-called repentance, well, it appeared superficial. He was happy proclaiming God's message of judgment rather than his message of grace. The bottom line is he didn't want God to be who he is. In Exodus 34, 6, God declared, as verse 2b states, I am a gracious God and merciful. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's that word has said. That's that covenantal love. And relenting from disaster. Remember what I said. Nineveh was the capital of Israel's enemy Assyria. And these people were the most wicked and cruel people imaginable in their day. Think of Hitler, Stalin, Hussein, but even worse. They persecuted, tortured, raped, murdered. You name it against Israel. So how could God see if these people thought Jonah? Phillips writes it was wrong of Jonah to believe for God's blessings and grace to be shown to Gentiles, especially Gentiles who had shown such violence to the covenant people of God, Israel. But God always knows better, doesn't he? The hymn writer reminds us the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus A pardon receives. You see, all who call upon the Lord in true repentance, who mourn for their sin, who confess it and seek God's forgiveness and grace, will be saved. Because Jesus died for those who mocked and beat and persecuted and nailed him to the cross. He took God's righteous anger for our sins upon himself so that we could be let off if we trust in him. Jesus doesn't show prejudice. So what's holding you back from trusting him? Sadly, Jonah is enveloped by bitterness. So much so that he wishes in verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. Do you see what he says? For it is better for me to die than to live. Imagine. He would rather die than live to see these dear sinners saved by Christ's wonderful grace. That is what sin, and that is what prejudice does. It stifles the work of the Lord. It blinds us to the necessity of reaching out to those who we may deem as unlovable, even those we may deem as our enemies. But imagine if Patrick didn't return to Ireland after his enslavement to share the gospel. Imagine if God didn't use Luther and Calvin and Knox 
because they buckled under the Pope's demands and didn't share God's word of truth. Our calling, you'll remember, is to go into all the world and make disciples of what? All nations. Not just those we like or those we get on with. Catholics, Muslims, Hindus, even Putin and King Jong-un, they need to hear the gospel to repent. Do you remember Paul? He himself realized this after persecuting Christians for many years. When God graciously saved him, he realized his folly and he earnestly served the Lord and he declared, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Why? Because Jews and Gentiles alike need the gospel. But I wonder, are we, as Clag and Presbyterian Church, are we taking every opportunity to do so? We should be. For secondly, we see Jonah misunderstands grace. The Lord asked Jonah in verse 4, Do you do well to be angry? In other words, why are you angry? I'm sure if we're all honest, we've been angry with God, haven't we? I admit I have. I've said before, after everything that happened with Eliza, and still sometimes it rises to the surface. I'm just a minister. Needing God's grace daily. We all struggle with anger. We've all admitted that. But I've learned that yes, it's okay to feel or to tell God that you're, fe- you're what the way you're feeling. It's okay to cry. It's okay to shout and rant. But we can never for one second accuse God of doing wrong. He is not the author of evil, says the psalmist. He reminds us that there is no evil in him. Guzik argues, yes, Jonah was angry towards God. And yes, it was all right for Jonah to state his anger towards God. But he must also repent of his anger towards God. Because ultimately, God does know best. And despite what Jonah felt, a sinner saved by grace from hell is always a wonderful thing to rejoice in. As Jesus said in Luke 15, 7, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who have no need of repentance. What prejudice or anger is holding you back from sharing the gospel with others? If God was to deal justly with each of us, not one of us would be saved. Jonah misunderstood God's grace, as do many today. And yet instead of sending another tempest of wrath, God allowed Jonah to wander, to cool off a bit. Well, really, he actually warmed up, didn't he? Verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should, should see what would happen to the city. In stubbornness, Jonah sat out the, outside the city. He makes a booth for shade and to do what? To see what would really happen. If God would bring down his wrath. You just imagine it. Sulking like a wean. How mistaken Jonah was if he thought God was going to change his mind. Especially when it comes to saving souls. And yet notice God's care towards Jonah in verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah. That it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Once again, God appoints nature to protect Jonah. Indeed, God has provided all we need and our complete protection through Jesus Christ who hung upon the plant of the cross in order to shade us from God's wrath for our sin. This plant, like the cross, shows that God's grace is no prejudice. The plant was an object lesson for Jonah, however, For in verse 7, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. God shows Jonah that he's still in control. As he told Moses, I will show mercy on whom I will have show mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Jonah isn't the boss and neither are we. We can't pick and choose who to share the gospel with. 
Jonah had a completely wrong misunderstanding of God's grace. And yet God shows Jonah what it would truly mean to feel his anger. Verse 8. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. The word anger in Hebrew, it literally means to be hot. I wonder today, are you in hot water with God? Repent. Trust in Christ alone. And know his relenting wrath upon your sin. Because thirdly, we see God's unprejudiced grace. Sadly, there are many like Jonah who complain about absolutely everything. And Spurgeon says, if dear friends like Jonah you want to complain, well, you will soon have something to complain about. Because notice God appointed the worm to eat the plant to teach Jonah a lesson about God's providential grace towards mankind. Jonah firstly feels the hotness of God's anger from the sun for his disobedience. But as Psalm 35 declares, for God's anger is but for a moment. And his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for a night, but joy comes in the morning. God tenderly asks Jonah again in verse 9, do you do well to be angry for the plant? But Jonah doesn't learn from his mistakes, does he? He replies, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. There are plenty of Jonas today who are never happy, even so-called Christians. I remember someone in a former church and nothing was ever good enough. All was doom and gloom and committee meetings were an absolute nightmare. Oh, we'll never pay that off. And then when we did, we spent a wild bit of money, didn't we? It's hard to love such people, isn't it? But we're called to. Notice God's love towards Jonah. He patiently works with him. Like Jesus, who often taught his complaining disciples using parables, so God does likewise. Keller writes, although Jonah reverts to his same angry opposition to God as he had at the outset, God, however, does not send a tempest, but instead he graciously counsels Jonah with a lesson through the plant. What a gracious God we have. Who even though we rant and rave, he is still patient with us. Verses 10 to 11. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came in, into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? And notice what God says and much cattle. God cares about all of his creation. But Jonah pitied one dead plant, over 120,000 dying souls. What does that show you about his priorities? Now before we point the finger, I wonder could it be said of us that we focus more on the temporal, the material things, rather than the spiritual matters and people's souls? Are we concerned more about reaching out with the gospel to those we like in our community than those who are careering towards a lost eternity? Are we building Christ's kingdom or our only palace? Are we Jonas? Unprepared to share the gospel with Catholics and Muslims and atheist friends and colleagues and family because we don't like them. God's grace is to be proclaimed to all mankind without prejudice until Christ returns. There are many today who don't know their right hand from their left. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. Or indeed, if they do, they choose not to. And yet Christ commands command before his ascension was to go into all the world to make disciples of all nations. He doesn't say make disciples among your friends or the people you like. No, he says all the nations, even those who are against you. For ultimately, we look to the greater Jonah 
Jesus Christ who came to preach a message of repentance and faith. Who came in God's grace to take the wickedness of the whole human race upon himself on that cross. So that all who believe in him, despite their race and creed and background or upbringing, would be saved for eternity. That is the gospel we are to proclaim. And prejudice has no place in God's great plan of salvation. For as Jesus told Nicodemus, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. To close, I'm sure many of you have heard of Mahatma Gandhi, a devout Hindu who sought peace and reconciliation across the world. But it's interesting that in his autobiography he wrote this, During my student days I read the gospel seriously and considered converting to Christianity. I believe that in Jesus' teaching I could find a solution to the caste system, that was dividing India. One Sunday I attended a church desiring to talk with the minister about becoming a Christian. When entering the sanctuary, however, the usher refused to give me a seat, suggesting that I worship with my own people. I left and never returned. If Christians also have caste differences, I said, then I might as well remain a Hindu. Do you see what prejudice does? It drives people away from experiencing the grace of the one true living God. It hinders Christ's work and his gospel. And may no one who comes through those doors of this church ever be ushered away. Everyone who comes through those doors into our offices, into our classrooms, our homes, should hear and know of Jesus' redeeming grace. Although Jonah harbored prejudice, he still proclaimed God's message and God used it to draw many to saving faith. Now sadly, Jonah ends there. But some in Jewish tradition record that Jonah then fell on his face and said, Govern your world according to the measure of mercy. As it is said to the Lord our God, belong mercy and forgiveness. We don't know what happened. But we praise God that he is still able to work through our mistakes as sinners. Because his grace is no prejudice. And to prove it, we look to the cross of Jesus Christ who gave his very life as a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. This is the amazing gospel, folks. May we declare it and live it out with our whole beings. For Christ's sake. Amen. As we respond to the message of God's word, we join together to sing our next item of praise that reminds us of God's grace. God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. And as we do so, the offering will be received.
join in prayer. God of grace, we want to thank you for that miracle of mercy that Jesus reaches down to us. Father, we confess once more our sinfulness. We confess like Jonah, we seek our own kingdom rather than yours. And yet today we bless you that because of Christ and his amazing love that took him to the cross of Calvary, that he shed his blood to pay our ransom. What an awesome cost to make us whole. Lord Jesus, we are so indebted to you. And may we never lose the awesome wonder of what you've done for us. In fact, may we declare it far and wide without prejudice because this amazing gospel, this good news is for all to hear. A Savior who came to redeem a dying and lost people from eternal suffering in hell. Holy Spirit, give us a boldness to declare your gospel without hindrance, without delay, without picking and choosing who to hear. May we be careful to give you all the glory that you are due. Lord, when we look at our world and see the continued wars and violence, when we see the persecution and death, we pray once more that you would bring your peace that surpasses all understanding, that you would bring stability and hope where it is needed. As you convinced the king of Nineveh, he was a wicked man of a wicked nation. So we pray that you would do the same with Putin the leaders of Hamas, the militia in Syria and Lebanon, Afghanistan, Nigeria, India and Myanmar and many other places where evil dictators have risen to power and are oppressing innocent people. Please, Lord God, work in their hearts and bring them to repentance. We remember those who have been devastated by natural disasters whether that's in Europe with the flooding or in Shanghai with the typhoon and in the Americas with the various storms. We pray for relief agencies as they seek to help those affected with aid. And especially those who are going out in the name of Jesus. We think of Christian aid and Tear Fund and Barnabas aid and many others who are seeking to provide for those in desperate need. May your light shine forth, we pray. Father God, we do want to thank you for what Ian shared on Wednesday night regarding mirth. We praise you for the work that has been done in the Middle East for the sake of Christ. We praise you for their goals of evangelistic outreach, of church extension, of biblical training and diaconal aid. For how they seek to raise up the local people in those lands to to spread the gospel amongst themselves. We thank you for the various programs that they have as they seek to speak into the Muslim world. Whether through radio or social media or internet, we praise you for the sound biblical teaching that is being given. As they train up pastors and teachers right across those nations. We pray for all who teach and all who are learning that you will raise up a generation of Bible workers for your kingdom. And we thank you for the online programs there, that they, that including... Dardisha 7 that seeks to speak to young people about real life topics and how God's word is speaking to them for goal and how they use sport to, to share the love of Christ and the various other programs that are going out on the world wide web Lord we pray that they will engage that they will listen and that they will respond in faith we thank you for this work and we entrust it to your keeping Lord God, we want to continue to remember the work of our congregations as many of the organizations have now restarted. We thank you today for Sunday school and Bible class, asking you to bless each teacher and helper and child and young person. We pray that this will be a blessed year for your kingdom. We thank of thirst as they prepare to get up and running. We pray that that will all go according to plan. There will be enough leaders, that there will be a real encouragement as the young people come along to hear of you. We want to thank you for a great start to campaigners and even our enrollment service. And yes, it was a little disappointing that there wasn't as many out. But Father, we thank you for each person who came, for the chiefs, the assistants, the clansmen. Lord, may we know your presence leading us forward. We thank you for our PWs. And we pray, Lord God, that you would bless them. And you would bless each woman who comes along and attends. That this will be used by you for your kingdom. 
We thank you for mothers and toddlers and for the uh, getting up and running again and the great turnout that there was and for the listening, Lord, that even those little children had as they heard the story on Wednesday. Lord, may the messages each week speak into their hearts. Remember the bowls and badminton and all the other things that are taking place. Lord, we commit them to you. And we pray, Lord God, that everybody who comes through our doors will hear the word of Christ and be welcomed without prejudice. Finally, Lord, you know all in our congregation who need your special touch in their lives at this time. Those who are sick or recovering, those going through treatments, those starting treatments, those who have had operations and recuperating, those who are in a spiritually dark place, those who are mentally in a place of real darkness and fear. Lord, in the stillness of our hearts, we name these people to you. Great physician of our souls and our bodies. Help us, Lord, to surround them in love, to surround them in prayer. And Father, may they even right now be very conscious of your near presence, supporting and comforting them in these days for the sake of Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. We can clear our service by singing our final item of praise. It's a modern piece that we started to learn uh, late earlier on in the year. It reminds us of our good and gracious King who came to save us. Let us stand to sing good and gracious King.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain and abide with you until Christ calls or comes and then forevermore. Amen. Thank you.